Well, I want to ask you this question and get you to think about this. What if there was only one virtue, one trait that we could have that would open ourselves up to more of God? What is that virtue? I want you to think about it right now. What would you say? Would you say it's love? Would you say it's faith? Would you say it's joy? Would you say it's holiness? What about power? Maybe it's giving or serving others. What would that one virtue be? If there was just one of all the virtues we see throughout the Word of God, if there's just one that would open ourselves up to more of God, what would that virtue be? Well, while you're thinking about that, I want to go to a story that's in the Old Testament, well-known story that we we'll commonly call David and Goliath. And this is where the young man David, and this was before he became king, he's still a shepherd, but he was serving King Saul some, and one day as Dad says, hey, I want you to bring some food to your three brothers that are fighting the Philistines and this big giant Goliath and go just go check on them. So David, as this young man, eagerly goes and he gets there and he sees this scene of Goliath out there in the middle of the field kind of taunting the Israelites, daring them to come out. He said, if anybody can beat me, then you've defeated our whole army. And the Israelite army was cowering in fear. And David, even as a young man, cannot believe what he's seeing. All these soldiers, these mighty men, all their weapons, they're fearful of this big, what we think is about a nine-foot man, and I can understand their fear. The dude was huge. But they're, they're just backing down. David can't believe it, and he just... He's like, I can't believe y'all are doing this. I can't believe nobody is going out there and fighting him. Well, his his kind of boldness and challenge reaches the king's ears. So King Saul calls him forward and says, I heard you're not okay with this. David said, no, I'm going to go fight him. And the king kind of looks at him and goes, "Mm, you're just a teenager, man. Uh, You're not that big. You're not that strong yet. But David's like, I don't care. He said, in fact, when I've been in the field watching the sheep, I've killed a bear, I've killed a lion, I've done what it took to defend what was mine, and I am not going to be silent and still while this man is taunting not just Israel, but he's taunting God. I'm not okay with this. So the king says, here, take my armor, it doesn't fit real well, and David's like, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to do what I know. And and we know the story, He he went and got five big old stones gets his staff, and he goes out to meet Goliath. And Goliath is like, are you kidding me? This is who you send, this little teenager? Come on. But I want you to see, we're going to read now the account of the story in 1 Samuel 17. We're going to see David's attitude, but we're going to see in there the virtue that opens ourselves up to more of God. Beginning in verse 45, it says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And then he goes on to say, and that all this assembly may know the Lord does not deliver by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And I wonder, because he said in the assembly, I wonder if he was talking about his brothers who were cowering in fear. I wonder if he was talking more to them than he was even to Goliath and the Philistines, because he was... Uh, almost embarrassed that they were standing back doing nothing while this giant was taunting Israel. The battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Now David was a bold young man, had just told the king of all his exploits in the field, field killing lion, bear, anything that tried to attack his sheep. So he was already a confident young man, obviously. 
But if you see in the story, we see this virtue because he knew that it would be God's help and God's strength that he would need to be able to defeat and kill Goliath. It was God's strength, David's cooperation. So it wasn't David's strength, it wasn't David's willingness, where he said, God, you come with me. No, he said, God, I'm going with you. You're going to defeat him, but I know you're going to work through me. So this key virtue, and while it's not specifically named in this story, and it may not seem evident, but we see it in David's words and in his heart, is this word, humility. That one may not have been on your list of words that you were thinking. Humility, a lot of times, we kind of push off to the side. We can even think it is a weakness. We can think, yeah, it's kind of a good trait, but man, that, that power thing or faith, love, and all those are great and necessary, and all of them do open us up to more of God. But humility is the key virtue. Why? Because all other virtues are rooted in humility. Why is that? Because it's the declining and the diminishing of self that's necessary for every other virtue. Think about love. What is love? It's putting somebody else before you. What does that require? Humility. Think about faith. Faith in Almighty God, a trust in Him, a deference to Him. What does that take? Putting God first. And believing in Him, it takes humility. All of these beautiful traits are rooted in humility. And it takes humility for all the virtues to come alive in our life. And that's why it is so crucial that we understand this trait and that it's active and alive and abundant in our journey. Andrew Murray, who wrote an incredible book, if you want to go read an, a great book on this subject, and it's simply a book called Humility. But he says this, he says, humility is the one indispensable condition of true fellowship with Jesus. Without humility, there can be no true abiding in God's presence or experience of his favor and the power of his Holy Spirit. Without this, no abiding faith or love or joy or strength. We've been in our journey the past few weeks of understanding how to have more of God, how to, how to have the deeper things of God be real in our life. And we've learned that the way to do that is this word disciple. And there's three goals of a disciple. The first one is just to be with Jesus. Well, that's what Andrew Murray talks about, that to have this fellowship with Jesus, it takes humility just to be with him. And then that being with him leads to us becoming like him. As we talked about in depth last week is that whatever we do comes out of who we are. In other words, our doing comes out of our being or who we are becoming. And so if we don't like what we're doing, then we have a, a who problem. It's not a what problem, it's a who problem. And, and that's why the Holy Spirit comes along and through Jesus and being with him, he comes and transforms us. And that's why we saw this thought last week is that becoming like Jesus is not about copying his behavior. It's not just about doing what he does only. What it is, it's receiving his nature from being with him. Because whoever you hang out is whoever you become like. And that becoming leads to what we do. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 10, 25. He says, it is enough for the disciple that he becomes like his teacher. So if we want to become like Jesus, then we need to understand who Jesus is. And there's a verse that really encapsulates Jesus in this thought of humility as our model. And it's Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. 
And he says, have this attitude, which was, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, so Jesus, holy God, says he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He emptied himself. He left his deity. He left his authority. As the creator of heaven and earth, as the word of God, supreme ruler in heaven, he says he left that. He took the form of a bondservant, making himself in the likeness of men. And then, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself. How did he humble himself? By becoming obedient. What was he saying? We learned this last week. That holiness is doing God's will. It's obeying what God says we're supposed to do. And it says he became obedient. He humbled himself. He's equal with God. He could have told the Father, no, I'm not doing that. But when God says, I need you to go down to earth, here's the plan. Jesus said, yes, Father, I'll do it. I'll leave my deity. I'll leave the place of honor. I'll leave the place where I am worshipped. And I'll go down to earth where nobody knows me. They don't know who, know who I am. I'll face all the rejection, all the mocking, whatever it takes, as long as I'm in your will. He humbled himself by being obedient, even to the point of death, even death on a cross, at that time the most cruel way for somebody to die. The king of heaven humbles himself. He's our model of humility. Humility is necessary to be with Jesus. And humility is necessary to become like him. Why would we even be with Jesus? Because we need him. That's humility. So this trait is so very important. But I want you to see this thought. Is that whatever spiritual thing you try to achieve with your natural strength will only achieve natural results. Or worse, you're going to fail. And I would argue getting a natural result is failure. And look, we can work at the spiritual things and we can do all the, all the good things we want to, but if it's only in our strength and our will and our wisdom, what are we going to achieve? Some good things. And good things are good. But good things always, not, are, are, are not always God. Sometimes we can do that. Well, this good thing that's in front of me must be God. Not necessarily. Some things of God we wouldn't even call good <laughs> because it's hard. Something like suffering. I don't think many of us would identify suffering as good. But God would say, yeah, but that's a necessary part of my plan to change your nature for you to become like me. We would call it bad. And God goes, no, it's good. And it's my will. We don't create our own suffering, but God does allow it. Sometimes even bring it. But it's good. But we can try to do, achieve good things that we bring before God. And say, see the good thing that I did. And God would go, it's really nothing. Because that wasn't me. You did it in your own strength. Whatever we try to achieve with our natural strength will only achieve natural results, which ultimately is a failure. So we don't become like Jesus with our own effort. It's not work, 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 work. It's the Holy Spirit working in our lives, which we allow. 
In other words, we cooperate with him. Much like David, what was he realizing? This is God's battle. I'm just cooperating with him. I'm just the vessel he's going to work through. But this is God. And because it's God, God will bring the victory. So what are we doing? We're just cooperating with God by not resisting the change when he starts putting his finger on certain things. Have you ever had that? God, God in a service like this or reading the word of God, God goes, hey, um, that thing you're doing, stop it. What? Yeah, it's not good. What? Yeah, it is. I like it. I don't like it. It's bad. Stop it. No, <laughs> I don't want to. And he kind of keeps putting his finger on. Y'all ever had that? And he starts pushing a little harder. And we refuse to change. He kind of starts changing stuff around us to get us to deal with it. Things start going a little south. And he's going, I'm trying to get this area to change. What's he doing? He's trying to transform us. He's trying to give us a new nature. What he's looking for us is just to go, yes, Lord, have your way in me. Do what you got to do to change me. And that's, that, that's a dangerous thing because we know God's changing is confronting. The, the Bible describes it, in fact, like a potter with clay. If you've ever watched a, a potter deal with clay, he's got his all, fingers and thumbs all up in that clay. And I, I don't think the clay's going, yeah, this feels good. It's not like a massage. You know, he, he's working that clay. And sometimes when it doesn't go right, he takes the clay and he pounds it back down to remake it. It's not fun or comfortable. It's painful at times. But yet, what's he trying to make? Something beautiful. And that's what God is doing with us. He's trying to change our nature. And it's not our effort that does it, but it is our cooperation. Dallas Willard said it this way. He said, life with results beyond the natural always depends on intimate interactions between us and God, who is therefore present. That's our be with God phase of being a disciple. He said these results could never come from you alone. There's a change he wants to make. There's something he wants to do inside of us. It's not just doing good. We're going to get to that. That is the third goal of a disciple, but the doing comes out of our being, so we've got to get our being right. We've got to become like Jesus. So here's our problem. We're trying to do it, and, and Paul says this in Galatians 3.3. 3. He said, are you so foolish? That's not a great way to start a sentence, by the way, Paul. You, you, you really lost your audience there. You can't get mad if I came over here and said, are you so foolish? Y'all be like, wait, hold on. Back up. But he says, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? What often happens in our Christian journey is, man, we know we need God. We're desperate for God. We cry out for Him. And we know that we know nothing. And we just need God. So, man, we're just excited to show up at church, excited to read the Bible. And, man, we're just, man, we're just soaking up everything. But the problem is, and the Bible warns us about it, is that we get all this knowledge and all of a sudden, the Bible says, it puffs us up. We start getting really kind of proud of what we know and what we're doing. And that's what was happening in Galatians. They knew a lot and they were actually doing good. But now, they were trying to transform themselves. And Paul said, you got a problem. You can't change yourselves. You started right. You began by the Spirit. But now you're trying to do it on your own? You can't. Flesh work will only achieve fleshly results. Spirit work will achieve spiritual results. So we've got to let the Holy Spirit do a work inside of us. And we don't change by giving our best effort and just kind of inviting the Spirit to come along with us. We allow Him to do the work, and we just don't resist. The theologian Bob Utley said this, he produces Christ-likeness in those who believe and cooperate with him, which is the goal of salvation. Obviously, believers do not work for their salvation, but after they are saved, they cooperate with the Spirit 
to live in Christ-like maturity. But we have a big problem, don't we? And it's been a problem since the beginning of time. And I think in our culture, as I've watched, it just is amplified. And it is this word self. We have a self-focus. We're self-centered. We're self-dependent. We're concerned about our self-image. We focus on self-promotion. And it shouldn't be called social media. It ought to be called self-promotion media. Look what I'm eating. Look what I'm wearing. Look what I'm doing. And it becomes this image thing. I was like, this is so funny. I, I just, I'm going to digress for a second. They, they had somebody, they were watching this person on the beach, and they, they were picking up trash. And they're like, man, how cool is this? And they had this big old trash bag, and they were like hauling it like this. And they're like, wow, this is really cool, until they realized it was a social media influencer, and they wanted to act like they were doing good. There's really nothing in the bag, but they were acting like it was hard, and they were just promoting themselves like they were this good person cleaning up the beach. And they basically, after the, the video person left, they just kind of left the trash there and walked off. And they were like, oh, you weren't doing good. You were just promoting yourself. Isn't that our world? And isn't that as Christians we can kind of get caught up in? Self-dependence, self-strength. Build yourself up. As, as what came along in, in, my, in my time during the 80s and 90s was self-help books. Great tips in there. But it's not self-help, it's spirit change. But we live in this world that is so focused on self. But the Bible calls this self-focused pride. The absence of humility. And what it says is it actually leads to a downfall. Proverbs 29, 23 says this, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. Now, where is pride revealed? In a lot of things. It, it can be in, in our appearance. It could be in our possessions, our abilities. It could be in our position. It could be in our name, our reputation. It could be our career. It could be that we're strong. Whatever it is, there's a lot of things that we can, we can really be proud of ourselves about. A lot of times when we would use the words I or my or mine, it reveals pride. I can do this. Look at what I did. Look at what I accomplished. Do you see my stuff? Whatever it is, it reveals pride. And we can rely upon all those things, whether it's our position, our appearance, our name, our reputation, our strength, whatever it is, to get what we want instead of depending upon God. So I have a question I just want you to think about for a moment. What's your badge of honor? What's that thing about yourself that you're really proud of? What would you hope people notice about you? What did you hope when you showed up this morning people would compliment you about? What would you hope if you get to tell somebody that they would, you get to tell them about yourself? What is that? What's that thing for you? Likely, that's your source of pride that reveals what you're, you're kind of building your life upon. And the problem is, it keeps God away. We're talking about having more of God. But those things that we're depending upon, we're proud about, we want others to notice, that's actually what keeps God away from us is those things. So while we're wanting more of God, we're actually pushing Him away. This is especially true with Christianity. Christians are, and, and I this isn't y'all, I'm, I'm talking about them out there. I, I know none of y'all like this, but those Christians out there, man, they're the worst in forms of pride. Why? We have God. We're His children. We have His blessings. We're higher morally. We don't do those things. Remember the man uh, Jesus was, was told the story about? 
he, he, he goes into the temple to pray. And he looks, and, and over there was a tax collector. And he goes, thank you, Lord, I'm not like him. I give generously. I fast once a week. I'm so holy. But Jesus said, dude, you missed it. He said, actually, the tax collector, which in that world was the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low. Jesus say, he's the one who went away justified. Why? Because that man stood before God and go, I am lowly. I'm nothing. I'm a sinner. I don't even deserve to be in this room praying to you. You shouldn't even listen to my voice right now because I'm the worst. And Jesus said he actually had the better attitude, though his lifestyle wasn't the best because he humbled himself instead of being all proud of who he is. But Christians can be, not us, Christians out there, they can be the most prideful. And the problem is they miss God. So let's look at four ways where humility shows up. And the first one is, we talked about this last week, but it's God's will before our self-will. We talked about that with holiness. It's doing God's will above all else. The Bible would, would use words like we deny the flesh. We die to ourself. We die to sin. We're dead to sin. Things like that. Where, where we don't say what I want to do, we say, God, what do you want me to do? It's God's will before our self-will. A second way it shows up is thinking more about God and others than ourself. In this world, we think about ourselves. We wake up thinking about ourselves. We wake up looking in the mirror, checking how, how do we look that day. We, we, we work an income to provide for ourselves and buy things we want. We take our free time to do what we want to do. It, it, it's a self-focused world. What God says, really, humility is you think more about God. God, what do you have for me today? God, what do you want me to do? Or, or as we go around, we see other people in their need and we help them. We see somebody's down, and we go talk to them. We see somebody that, that could use something we have, and we say, you know what? I'd rather you have it than me have it, and we give it up. He said, that, that's humility, and it's hard. But we're placing, others, we're placing God and others more important than ourselves. And as Christians, sometimes we can kind of have that as an ideal, kind of the, this lofty thought or an ambition. But in reality, it's not there. Philippians 2, 3 through 5, and we read verse 5 earlier, but the verses before it says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. And don't merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. And this is where we began earlier. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself, and on and on. So if we look at the verses earlier, what Jesus emptied himself, why did he do it? He considered others more important than himself. The Father and mankind. And he said, I'll do what it takes. I'll leave my lofty position where I'm really comfortable and really happy. And I'll take care of others. That's humility. Another form of humility is God getting the honor and glory, not ourself. So opposite of our self-centered and self-image society, where we want the honor. We want to be recognized. We get upset when somebody at work gets noticed when we did way more than they did. I mean, don't you see what I'm doing? Are you kidding that you're honoring them? They just did it one time. I've been doing it for years. Why are, you, why are you honoring them? And we get all offended. They got the honor. They got asked to do something that we should have been asked to do. Somebody got promoted before us. They didn't deserve it. I deserve it. Don't you see how hard I work? We want the honor. 
where God says, you don't worry about all that. Just give me honor. Give me glory. That's why, why, that's why beginning of service is so very important. That the first thing we do is we're going to give God honor and glory through our worship. Before anything that feeds us, we want to give to God what he wants. Matthew 23, 12, Jesus says this. Whoever exalts himself, in other words, honors himself, <laughs> you're going to get humbled. And it may be God doing it. Where God goes, oh, you think that way about yourself and you're trying to get all that? Yeah. Let me, let me change some things around, humble you a little bit. But he says, actually, but the one who humbles himself, God will exalt. You want the honor? Go the humble route. And trust me, God's going to honor you. It may not look the way you want it to on here. And it may not even happen on earth. But God says, I'm going to honor you. And I'm going to give you a position of importance. And then the last one, which is really the biggest form of humility, is depending upon God more than ourself. To go back to our friend Andrew Murray, he said this, Humility, the place of entire dependence on God. I mean, look at that. Humility, the place of entire dependence upon God, is from the very nature of things, the first duty and the highest virtue of the creature, and the root of every virtue. And so pride, or the loss of this humility, is the root of every sin and evil. Wow. Such a powerful statement. But this dependence upon God. Think about Jesus as we're becoming like him. His entire life was marked upon dependence and trust in God. Think about from, from getting baptized. Jesus didn't get baptized. John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. It was for sinners to come and confess all their sins and get things right. But the father told Jesus, said, you go get baptized. So Jesus goes, okay, Father, I'll do it. He didn't need to, but he trusted God. Being led into the wilderness by the Spirit where he was tempted for 40 days. Going without food, but just trusting God. Coming back in the power of the Spirit. And Acts 10, 38 says he went around doing good by the Spirit. It wasn't just him doing it. He wasn't like, I'm God, I'm going to do this good. He relied upon the Holy Spirit. And he was always seeking God's guidance through prayer. Always. He's God. But yet he would go to the Father and go, what do you want me to do? He didn't just do things himself. Think about the 12 disciples. Jesus has all these followers. And he could have just, you know, kind of sat back and thought about it. You know, I really like this one. He's got some good speaking skills. This one's a hard worker. This man, he's got a great attitude. He could have, he could have looked at natural things to pick. So he picked 12 men. But what did he choose to do? Spend an entire night, didn't go to sleep all night long, to go to the Father and say, Father, who do you say those 12 men are? What was he doing? Depending upon God. And what's interesting is one of the 12 God gave was the one that would betray him and send him to the cross. But Jesus trusted God. His whole life was built upon depending upon him. That's why he said in John 5, 19, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself. What a powerful statement. Jesus, who's God, says the son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does in like manner. Humility. He goes on to say in chapter 12, beginning of verse 49, For I don't speak of my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, I speak. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Humility. Jesus, the humble path, we take the humble path of being dependent upon God. 
Philippians 4.13. Y'all should know this verse very well. I can do all things. Right? Man, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But man, I can do all things. I think sometimes we get the, the verse out of order. It's through him who gives me the strength. Some of you are going through it right now. Some of you've got the world pressing down. You've got bad news. You've got things all around you. You're, you're wondering, how can I do it? Man, that's a great attitude. Because that question leads us to the answer. Through him who gives me the strength. Dependence upon God. And by the way, let me just tell you, you can make it through what you're going through right now. Because God is with you. And God is for you. And he is fighting on your behalf. And he is moving mountains out of your way. And he is doing great things. Why are you going through it? Because God's trying to change your nature. And it's going to turn you into something better than you've ever been before. Just depend upon God and get Philippians 4.13. I can do this through Jesus who gives me the strength. Catch this thought is that voluntary humility opens us up to more of God. James 4, 6 says it this way, but he gives a greater grace. What is grace? It's God's free gift of whatever you need. It's his generosity. It's his answer. It's his provision. It's his strength. It's his wisdom. It's his goodness. Whatever you're needing, it's encapsulated in this amazing word, grace. And that's why they wrote a song, Amazing Grace. <laughs> because it is amazing. And he gives a greater grace. And that's why it says God is opposed to the proud. He resists the proud. But look at this. He gives grace. He gives whatever you need to those who choose to depend upon God. To the humble. And if Jesus had to depend upon God for his success, don't we have to be the same? Of course we do. And whatever we think we're able to accomplish in our own strength spiritually, God will allow it to look otherwise. We think we're accomplished great things. God says it's going to be nothing. We can't change our life. We can't bring victory. We can't direct our own life. It will fail. But if we depend upon God and trust him, everything that we want, every spiritual good thing will come to us. That's why Proverbs 16, 18 says this. Pride goes before destruction. It's going to go bad. Whatever you think you're all good at, it's going to go bad. It's going to fail. But it's, and it says, a haughty spirit before stumble. But remember, God gives grace to the humble. I'm going to read a, a long quote from Dallas Willard, but it's so appropriate. It says, in seeking and receiving God's word to us, we must also seek and receive the grace of humility. Our being humble allows God to speak to us because he knows we will not misuse his word. Lack of humility causes problems. Humility is the quality that opens the way for God to work because God resists the proud. Moses was one of the most humble, least presumptuous human beings who ever walked the earth. And Moses also may be the all-time record holder for lengthy conversations with God. Certainly a connection existed between his meekness and his close working and talking relationship with God. And Proverbs 25, 9 says of God, He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. I want you to just right where you are, bow your head and close your eyes. If you're watching online, right where you are, let's just come into a moment of reflection. Let's just think about what God is sharing with us today. And I want you, as you're reflecting and examining your life, 
What is God putting his finger on for you? What is God saying? Well, we think we're all that. He goes, no, that's pride. Where is he saying that you've been trying to do this yourself? Provide for your needs. Heal yourself. Whatever it is, become more godly. And he says, no, you're doing that in your own strength. That's pride. You're not relying upon me. What's he put his finger on that you're doing things the way you want it done? You're living life the way you want to live. And God says that's pride. What's he saying to you right now? Now is the moment with God. Now is this moment where we have an opportunity to humble ourselves and get this right. One form of humility is repentance, where we say, no, I need to change just the entire way I think about myself and life. So my question is, what are you going to do today? As we've heard the word of God, and in a moment, we're going to go back into our world. Are you going to go back the same? Or is today the day of change where you say, no, I'm going to humble myself before God. I'm going to do what He wants me to do with my life. I'm going to depend upon Him for whatever I need. I'm going to begin to seek His will through prayer. I'm going to begin to think way more about Him and others than myself. What is it for you? And I would encourage you, don't leave today till you have that right with God. And in just a moment, we're going to tell you about how you can do that. But for those of you in this room, those of you watching online, let me just pray for you in this moment. Father, what a, what a tough word, this word humility. To think less about ourself. To depend upon you, though we're able, we have the strength, we have the knowledge. To trust you and we can figure it out ourselves. Oh, it's so hard. But Lord, we want more of you. In fact, we want all of you. We want nothing hindering you from our life. So right now, we choose the humble path. We choose to put you first. To seek your will. To depend upon you as our strength. Lord, we need you. Come on, why don't you tell God right there where you are, I need you. Come on, tell him again, say, I need you. You know what you're facing. Maybe everything's good. That's not always good. Because we don't need God. Father, we need you. And I bless your people. I bless them just with the grace and the virtue of humility. And as we... We be, go back to our world, Lord, that our mindset changes and we think differently about things. But I bless your people with your goodness, with your grace. I bless them with your love. I bless, bless them with your provision that meets their every need. I bless them with your healing that touches every weak and sick point in their body. I bless them with protection in a dark and dangerous world. And I bless all of my church family with the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Come on, why don't we give God the very best hand clap we give. Amen. Love you guys.